So after bragging for 13 consecutive weeks of what beautiful weather we're enjoying here uh, on Sabbath mornings, God said, oh yeah, I've got some other type of weather that's out there too. So uh, this is what fall is going to start to feel like. And of course, if you're from Michigan, you know that it has a whole lot more to offer. So we're glad that you're here today on a overcast, breezy, but still beautiful Sabbath day. Amen? And right as I say overcast, half of you got shot in the eyes with the sun breaking through the clouds. <laughs> How many of you got an email from me yesterday? Some of you did. Some of you did not. Some of you didn't even know that was an option. One of the things that I'm trying to do, and I didn't do it over the summertime because I just didn't do it, no excuses, I'm trying to do better at communicating with our church family and letting you know what you need to know as you get ready for our worship for the upcoming week and for the weekend and, and everything that comes with it. And so I'm trying to send out a happy Friday email to the church family. Some of you get it. I think about 68 of you are currently on that list. That is something that I would ask you to opt into. I don't want to sign you up for it arbitrarily because I don't want to get flagged for sending you spam that you don't want. Some of you don't want to get those emails, and that's fine. But if you are interested in getting our regular emails, just send me a message. My email is right here on our bulletin. You can go to pastor at pawpaw.church, send me an email, say, send me the weekly bulletin, and I'll do that for you. And in fact, while you're holding your bulletin and looking at the page that has the green on it, I want you to look just above Let's Connect at something called Church Center. I want to take just a second and encourage you to download that app if you have a smartphone. Church Center is a really cool free app that has been set up by the company that manages our membership database software. And basically what it is, is it's going to become our central hub for a lot of useful information for you as you worship and connect with our church family. For example... You wake up and you want to know who the preacher is. You open up Church Center, you'll see the digital bulletin right there. You want to be able to give online as approximately 80 or 85% of our offerings tend to come in is through online services. You want to know how to do that? There's a button right there for how to give. You want to know what's on our calendar? What are we doing this weekend? What's this upcoming week? Hop on our, our Church Center app, you'll find the church calendar. Church calendar or uh, church center app has all sorts of other cool features that we'll be adding as time goes on. You can submit a digital prayer request. We don't pass a, a card around here. Sometimes we have prayer requests that we pick up through social media or word of mouth. But if you have something to share with the church family, you can click a button right there and submit a digital prayer request, and we'll get that right away. If you're looking for any sort of information about who we are or what we stand for, it's right on our church center. And... How many of you ever use our directory? Ever need to get in touch with a church family? Church Center is going to become the new directory system that we use to replace the old one that hasn't been updated in several years that would integrate like into your phone's contact sheet. That, that system honestly was a bit cumbersome to deal with. It was a separate database. This one uses our existing database to come up with a church directory and it will only share the information that you want to share. You don't want the whole church family to have your phone number? Don't check that box. If you want people to have your email address but not your work email address, check that box. You can control what information, including what picture we use for the directory. Andrea did a great job at taking those beautiful posed family portraits. But I know some families prefer to update their portrait from time to time. Our kids don't look like they did six months ago, for example, or eight months ago, or, or whatever. And so you can update your picture. And it's all free, and it's all controlled by you. So if you get a chance with a smartphone and you're interested in knowing how to stay in touch with our church family, check out the Church Center app in your smartphone's app store. And I would encourage you later today to check your email for an email from either Planning Center or Church Center. I don't know which one it's going to come from, because you are all going to get invited to be a, or to let your information show up in our directory database. We cannot put you in there without your permission. And so you'll be getting an email, and it is legit. It is not spam. We are not going to sell you out to anybody or anything. This is just something in-house so that we as a church family can, can stay connected and help one another as we go through this crazy COVID world we're in right now. 
So that's an announcement I wanted to bring to your attention. Any questions about that? Everybody's okay? If you've got questions, find me afterwards. I'll help, I'll help uh, clarify things for you the best I can. Now here we are, worship service, sermon time. And I got to say, as much as I love to stand up here, it is kind of nice on a Sabbath to be able to sit and rest, especially after a week like I've had. This past week, I really kicked it into high gear. Some of you know that I've been running quite a bit. I'm really trying to uh, turn my, my life around and my, my health around. First week of March, I was 30 pounds heavier than I am right now. I'm trying to eat better. I'm trying to run more. Put in 50 kilometers this week, and my legs are a little sore, so I'm going to try to keep this sermon short, sweet, to the point. But uh, one of the things that I do when you're out running like that is you have to find something to kind of keep your brain going. Otherwise, you just start to, like, it, it just gets hard to go out and run if you don't have, for me at least, if you don't have music or something to listen to. And full confession, I've recently discovered a, a uh, I'm going to go with a, it's a bit of a biography that's been dramatized and set to music that I've enjoyed listening to. Uh, it's the story of one of our founding fathers. It was the, uh, <laughs> somebody saw the, I saw you mouth it, yeah. It's the story of Alexander Hamilton that has been set to very rhythmic and catchy music. Uh, some of you have probably seen the theatrical edition that was a Tony Award winning uh, version. And yeah, I have to admit, it's kind of fun to listen to the story of our founding fathers and the things that they went through as they tried to make this nation what it is and get it out from what it was. And, and, and I love to hear the stories of people like Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr and, and George Washington. And I'll, I'll tell you, Here Comes the General is one of those songs that really keeps me going when, when I'm hitting a couple of miles in. And it's, it's the perfect tempo. It's, anyway, it's a lot of fun to study to learn, to learn, or to pick up the examples of the great leaders of history. Great leaders are exciting to follow, to learn about, and to want to emulate. But one of the things that we need to do uh, a little bit of discussion on here, we need to discuss what makes people great leaders and why they're important. And I'll give you a heads up. We are going to spend, after Labor Day, Several weeks studying great biblical leaders. I figure this time of year, especially this year, it'd be a good thing to take the time to sit down, to open up God's word, and to see some of the famous and infamous leaders that have come up throughout, earth, or throughout biblical history. To see the men and women that have been called to the front of the nation to be the faces and representatives of God. And in one instance, of course, or in a few instances, these are not even human leaders who still have influence over humanity. What makes them great or not so great? But what I want to talk about today is almost the, the prequel to that upcoming sermon series. The prequel to it is something that I'm calling, instead of leadership, we're going to talk about followership today. Followership is the process of being a follower. Leadership is the process of leaders, uh, being a leader. Followership is the process of being followers. A great leader without followers is just somebody going for a walk. Have you heard that before? If you are a leader and you have no followers, you're just out for a walk. It is a relationship between leaders and followers that accomplish things. We spend a lot of time talking about and singing about and dancing about leaders. This past, uh, this, what is it, yesterday. Yesterday was the 57th anniversary of the Million Man March on Washington, D.C. But the story that we often tell is just the story of one of those million men, certain Reverend Mar Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., just over a week and a half ago, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of women gaining the right, the guaranteed right to be able to vote with the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And we tell the story of not the hundreds and thousands of women and men who made that possible. 
We tend to focus on the leaders, like the Susan B. Anthonys and the, and the Elizabeth Statins. We talk about leaders. Do we take the time to talk about followers? Because while not everybody will be a leader, everybody at some point will have to wrestle with what it means to be a follower. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about followership. Why is it that some groups can come together to change the world and other groups feel like they're herding cats just to get them to reply to their emails? You know what I'm talking about. How can followers work together with leaders to help make our classrooms, our churches, our cities, and our nation healthy and successful in 2020 and beyond? That's what we're going to talk about today as we prepare to open God's Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for thus far holding back the reins so that we can gather together to open your Word and to learn not only what it means to lead, but today to learn what it means to follow. Lord, I pray that you would bless us as we try to figure out what it means as we work together to do your will. Lord, I pray that you'd bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Today's sermon is quite honestly, could be a whole class. We could spend 16 weeks, a whole semester studying this topic out and not cover, the, cover everything there is. I could cover dozens of, th- of specifics or, or whatever the case may be. I could spend hours, write books on followership. You and I both know we don't have time for that today. My legs will give out, my voice will give out, and your, uh, your attention span will give out, no matter how comfy your chairs are. So as a pastor, I'm going to do what's comfortable, and I'm going to give you a three-point sermon. Three points, and then I'm done. I haven't done one of these in a while, so bear with me. I'm, I might be a little rusty. Three points. Point number one. We're going to talk about followers. Good followers don't just insist on always getting what is best for themselves. They are humble enough to be willing to go along for the ride because they realize it's the best thing for everyone. You want to know what makes a good follower? Good followers don't just follow, they submit. If you're looking for biblical reasoning on why we need to learn this lesson, that good followers learn how to submit, you don't have to look any further than perhaps the most famous group of the Old Testament followers that were out there, the Israelites. The Israelites are this faceless mass of people who followed various leaders, often terribly so. They followed people like Moses and drove him crazy. They followed people like the the, uh, Joshua's and and the kings and, and the judges, and they drove them crazy. And part of the reason is, and this is the heartbreaking line, I mentioned the judges, The judges are that that sort of in-between period, that period between Moses and the kings, people like David and Solomon, when they had people who were set up to do the work that was needed to be done, but nobody took them seriously. And unfortunately, what we find is this line that that sort of becomes the chorus for for the, the nation of Israel in the book of Judges. The last verse of the book of Judges, Judges chapter 21 and verse 25 says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The author of that verse, I must confess, was severely mistaken. The author claims there was no king in Israel, but in reality there were two. God was supposed to be their king as he reveals to the prophet Samuel. He wanted to be the monarch who sat on their throne. And we'll talk more about God as king in that upcoming series. But let's be honest. They didn't want to listen to God any more than Adam and Eve wanted to listen to God. Any more than any of us sometimes want to listen to God. God gives us all sorts of recommendations and and suggestions. And dare I say, commandments. Like that perfect 10 that Jessica and Stephanie sang about during children's story. Great way to put that to music. I look forward to to catching the clip on that on social media later so I can hopefully learn that song and, and use it with my own family. And we'll often look at God and his big 10 
written with his finger on tablets of stone, and will say, those are handy suggestions. But I've got a better way. To be quite honest, the nation of Israel didn't just have one king, and that was God. And be honest, they didn't have two kings. They had a million kings. Because everybody wanted to be their own king. The verse said, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. This is something that we have to wrestle with as Christians, as humans, and dare I say, as Americans. That's one thing that makes America special, is we have a little bit of rebel in us, don't we? Our nation was founded by a group of people who wanted to do something different than what the Church of England told them to do. And so they set sail for the new world. And once they came over here and they settled down, they weren't comfortable with what England was doing to them. They didn't like the King Georges of the world. And so they rebelled and revolted and did their own thing. Throughout our nation's history, it seems like every time we turn around, we are fighting and rejecting and rebelling against society, against the government, against its ways. We fight over things as a nation. Things like slavery, civil rights, injustice, masks, executive orders. We fight and we rebel against things that we see as just or unjust. Pretty much, to be quite honest, in our rebel spirit, the only thing that we can all agree on is that Taco Bell needs to bring back their potato dishes and the seven-layer burrito. And that is the line that's going to get the best reaction today. <laughs> Good followers don't just insist on getting what is best for themselves. They are humble enough to go along for the ride because they realize it's the best thing for everyone. Good followers don't just follow, they submit. This is a lesson that husbands and wives have to learn, that parents and children have to learn, that pastors and parishioners have to learn, that teachers and students have to learn. Paul talks about this in the church of Ephesus and in Ephesians chapter 5 and chapter 6, how we should relate to one another. And sometimes it means that even though we don't agree with something, we realize that I might not like it, but it's what is best for us. And if you're looking for a good example in what it means to submit, you have to look no further than the man who is our example, the namesake of the Christian church that's Jesus. Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, Paul says, let me pick up my debris here. Starting in verse 4, let each of you not look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which was yours in Christ Jesus, the one who, though he was in the form of God, he didn't count equally with God something to be grasped. So he emptied himself. He took the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus could have opted to say, I already have my throne, and that's good enough for me. But he didn't, because he knew it wasn't what was best for all of us. Because he knew what we were headed for. He knew what our fate was. He knew that if he was going to sit on the throne, that he was going to have nobody in front of him. And what is a leader without followers? What is a king without a, without a nation? What is our creator without his creation? What is Jesus without those that he made in his image? Satan fights for the throne. Jesus died on the cross. We need to learn how to be humble and submissive. No matter how much that rebel spirit comes out in us. 
And we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. But Jesus humbled himself, submitted, and followed the plan. And that's the next important point, is that good followers don't just follow a person, they follow a vision. They don't just follow, they go. Jesus didn't just follow God because God arbitrarily said, because I said so, that's why. As much as a parent wishes their children would do it, just because I said so, that's why. Jesus saw the big picture, what it's all about. He caught the vision. He knew the plan, and that's what he bought into. And that's sometimes what we struggle to buy into. As Christians, as parents, as children, as students, whatever the case may be, we struggle when we don't know the why. When we tell our kids to do something and they look at us, why? I have a five-year-old. You know what her motto is, why? And sometimes you just get to the point of, because I said so. That doesn't always cut it, though. It doesn't. And so you try to give them an explanation, and it might not make sense. And so you know what you do? You try again. And you find something that helps them to buy into the vision. Because if they are just buying into the person and not into the vision, what happens when the person isn't looking? You know where I noticed that? Jesus spent three and a half years teaching, coaching, mentoring, vision casting to his disciples. And when he died, what did they do? What was the very first reaction? And in fact, even before he died, think to those final 24 hours when life started to get hard. What did they do? They turned and ran and hid. This was the point where they should have been out running around saying, this is everything that he's been talking about. This is everything that he's all about. This is the plan. Look! And instead, they turned, they fled, and they hid. Jesus had to come and find them behind locked doors and to say, come on, guys. Come out. Get out. Even when I'm not here, what I stand for is still here. What my life's mission is all about is still here. It's not just Jesus and the disciples that had this problem, of course. I mentioned those other followers, the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel had this problem too. God gave them a vision. You guys are supposed to come out of Egypt, go to the promised land. But did they all buy into the vision? No, of course not. They were just following a man. And what happens every time life got hard for them? Because they didn't have the vision, they immediately murmured and complained and wished that they could go back. Even though something better was just on the other side waiting for them, this land flowing with milk and honey was waiting for them, they would rather go back to Egypt than to go on this journey towards something better. They were only seeking after the leader. Here's the thing. They were happy to stare at the back of their leader's head as he led from the front. But the minute they lost sight of the back of his head, they lost sight of everything that he stood for. And then they started to look for somebody else's head to stare at instead. Who was supposed to be the leader of the nation of Israel? Come on. Who was the leader? Who was the one that they were supposed to follow, the nation of Israel? God. But they had a hard time seeing him. And so they grabbed hold of somebody else instead. Who did they grab hold of? This person became their, their everything. This person was a guy named Moses. What happened when Moses wasn't around? 
they went out and looked for another substitute. Exodus chapter 32, starting in verse 1. In Exodus 32 and verse 1, the nation of Israel looks around and says, well, I haven't seen Moses in a while. We need to do something about that. We need to replace Moses as a leader. And they built a golden calf. They lost track of why they were doing what they were doing. And the next thing you know, they have created a leader that is fundamentally contrary to everything the leader should stand for. And within just God, Moses, golden calf, they have completely 180'd on every value and every principle that God stood for and was trying to teach them to, to follow to. It's amazing how quickly they've abandoned their values because they, were, they didn't have the vision. Let's contemporize this just a little bit. Let's be honest. Is there anybody else out there who's a little sick and tired of hearing the phrase every four years, the lesser of two evils. I don't know which side you're voting for. I don't know which side you voted for in 2016, 2012, or, or who you're already planning to cast a vote for in 2024. It happens, and it's said all the time. You look at it and you say, who is the lesser of two evils? Every couple of years, we hear a little bit from some guy with some shiny new ideas. And we think it sounds good enough, and we jump on their bandwagon. Even if they don't have any specific details of how they're going to accomplish any part of their ideas or their vision. And then the next one comes along, and we jump off the old bandwagon and hop on the new one. Every four years, every four years, more competing voices as people battle to become the leader. At what point do we step back and ask ourselves, where do we want to end up, not every four years, but big picture? As Americans, as Michiganders, as Christians, where do we want to end up big picture? And who are the leaders or what people are the ones who are best equipped to get us to where we need to be? Rather than just stepping back and saying, well, of these two people that these, these organizations are putting forward, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a tiger, by it. I don't know about you. The idea of our nation fundamentally changing its identity and its direction every four years is getting a little whiplashy to me. I'm getting, so, I'm getting tired of swinging really hard to the right and then really hard to the left and then really hard to the right again like I'm on a ride at Cedar Point. If I wanted to ride at Cedar Point, I'd hop in a car with Troy and Amy and head down to Sandusky. I don't want our nation to feel like an amusement park. I want to know where we're supposed to head and follow leaders who are going to get us there. But that's for a different sermon. Let's talk church setting. Because we are just as challenged in the church as we are as Americans in this nation. Because let's be honest, every couple of years, the pastor goes, and the new pastor comes in, and the new pastor brings shiny new ideas, and we get excited and we follow him this way. And then they run out of shiny new ideas. And so they go take their shiny new ideas to a different church. And a new one comes in, and we swing back this way. Every couple of years, the pastor comes, the pastor goes. Hopefully, as followers, as a church community, we should know what our vision is for this church community so well that if I did not show up, you could still go forward. Hypothetically speaking, I get a call to go to Minnesota. I'm not excited about the idea of going to Minnesota. I like being on the right side of Lake Michigan. Sorry, that's a geography joke. It's also why I'm not going to go to Wisconsin anytime soon. But hypothetically, if I'm gone 
and you are pastorless, leaderless. Don't have somebody to listen to go on all Sabbath morning. Is this church going to go forward with what God has called it to do? What has God called this church family to do? What are our visions? What's our mission? What's the work that he's put on this church family's heart? I hope you know it. And the reason that this is important, actually, and what this would look like to me, honestly, it reminds me of something I learned when I was in seminary. Class in church leadership, Dr. Skip Bell. Skip Bell was an amazing professor. I love sitting down and, and listening to his experiences because he wasn't afraid to admit that he was flawed as a leader. He didn't walk on water. He was still growing and maturing. He was just going to share from his own, not only successes, but also failures. And the very first failure that he acknowledged was that he had the wrong vision for what a pastor should be about and what a church should be about. And it manifested itself at a very first board meeting. Anybody ever sat on a church board before? He was all excited, fresh out of seminary. He shows up to the church board meeting 10 minutes early because he wants to make sure to set a good example. He's got his agenda in hand. He's ready to go, and he pulls in the parking lot, and the parking lot is full. He's like, huh, everybody's so excited to hear what I have to say. All my shiny new ideas, fresh out of seminary. And he goes to this room where the board is supposed to meet, and he opens the door. And you ever get the feeling you walk into a room and you could tell that they just stopped everything because you're coming in? Like you just walked into a place that you don't belong? He got that feeling immediately. Like he could tell they just, they were doing something in there and they stopped as soon as he showed up. Okay, well, the room is full. There's, there's just one op open chair and I guess that's mine. I'll go sit over there and we're all here early. Let's get started with the meeting, he said. And so he reaches into his bag and he's pulling out his agenda. And at that point, the, uh, the gentleman sitting right next to him, conveniently placed, you know, one of those, those lifelong pillars of the church kinds of people who's perhaps, I don't know, staring at me from the corner of the church, noting that it's after 11 o'clock now. <laughs> he kind of says, hey, pastor, we got to talk for a second here. We need to make something very clear. Pastors come and pastors go, but the church stays. This is our work to do that God has put on our hearts. You're going to give us some ideas on how to get the work done, but it is our responsibility to carry this work forward, not yours. And so pastor, you're welcome to come to our board meeting anytime you want to. We'll even let you have the devotional. But then when it's time to actually talk about the work that God has put in our hearts, take a seat, watch, listen, and take notes on your calendar because that way you'll know where we are going, where God is leading us. It is a tremendous reminder that the, that church in particular caught the idea that they are not there to follow a person. They are there to follow a God who gives a vision and a plan. Because good followers don't just, don't just follow a person, they follow a vision. They go. And when they go, they go wholeheartedly. The three, point number three, just so you know where we are, good followers don't just contribute the minimums. They are willing to give up everything. They don't just follow, they sacrifice our scripture reading today, thank you, Dylan, for sharing that. The reminder that when Jesus called his disciples, one of the things that they did, he just said, follow me. And they realized that this wasn't a half-hearted, part-time decision to become a follower. This was wholehearted, sacrificial. And time and time again, it says that they left all and followed him. And this isn't just New Testament Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 19, the prophet Elijah comes up to a man named Elisha. And he says, hey, God said that I need you to follow me. I need, I need somebody to follow me. We got to work on this together. And Elisha says, at, at this time, Elisha's plowing the field. He just, he's just doing his job. 
And, and out, of, out of nowhere, up comes the prophet, and he says, follow me. And Elisha says, hey, can I at least go say bye to mom and dad? And he says, if you're going to go say bye, say bye to mom and dad, you might as well stay with them. I need somebody who's willing to, to leave everything right now on the spot. And Elisha said, you're right. He slaughtered the oxen. He gave everything away and he took off right there on the spot because there was no going home once God calls you to go forward. And that's a tough calling because some of you might not be quite ready to leave all and follow him. But here's the thing. While we might not all be called to full-time ministry like pastors or prophets, we are still called to leave all to become full-time followers of God. And when I say leave all, I mean all that this world is tempting and enticing us with, everything that this world has done to saddle us and weigh us down and to become burdens upon us, we are to leave all of these sinful things that the devil is using to hold us back from following God. He has done his best to weigh us down with addictions and struggles he has done his best to weigh us down with sin in a way that makes it so we feel like it's impossible to follow God fully. Because man, it is just, how can I go forward following you when I have to deal with this addiction or that struggle? And to be quite honest, how many of those addictions and struggles and sins, is there anyone out there that God cannot say, I can deal with that. I died to set you free from that. My strength will help you when you are weak as you wrestle with out, coming out from under that. Is there anything that comes between you and God that God can't just simply say, be gone, and it is? To be quite honest, the problem isn't any of the theology. The problem is us. How often is it that we look at it and say, that's a great idea, but uh, I'm not quite ready to sacrifice where I'm comfortable. I know what I like, I know what I don't like, and, and I'm okay with that. It can be easy to look at the struggles that we're facing, the times that we're challenged, and to look at it and simply say, I'm not ready to give that up yet. And then the painful part is when we blame leadership because we're not ready to be a part of the followership process. When we're not ready to sacrifice, to follow what the leaders are calling us to do, what God wants us to do. How easy is it to blame leaders when we're not doing our part? We can blame the teacher from last year that we didn't learn. It's their fault we didn't learn. It's not my fault that I stayed up until two, two o'clock in the morning playing video games. We can blame the pastor for not preaching better sermons and it's the pastor's fault why I didn't do my devotionals. It's easy to blame current and or former government officials for what's going on with how we treat one another. It's not my fault that I don't want to get up and exercise or to make better choices with how I spend my time. It's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault that I'm not doing what I know I should be doing. Paul talks about this, wrestles with this, identifies this clearly. Romans chapter 7 and verse 15. Let's be honest. The, th the things that we are supposed to do, those are the things that sin try to convince us to not do. And because of sin, the things that we know we shouldn't be doing, those are the things that we often cling to. I've got something better for you than sin. I've got something better for you to sacrificially give up for. Think about how much money and resources and time and energy we are willing to sacrifice for sin. Think about what Jesus sacrificed to set us free from it. Are we willing to do any sacrificial level of, of giving up of self to follow him? Are we willing to set aside watching that TV show to spend a little bit more time doing family worship? I know, time's up. But Jesus is our example. 
Jesus was repeatedly tempted to do anything but the sacrificial thing. And his prayer was, not my will, but yours be done. He knew that in order for us to have anything, that he would have to give up everything. And so I hope that you're doing something with it and not treating it like it's nothing. Jesus isn't just a leader because he's a great leader. Jesus was a great follower as well. He demonstrated humble, vision-oriented, self-sacrificial followership when he was here on this earth. And he's calling us to do the same. The appeal that he made to his disciples at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, was to go and make disciples. To teach them everything that I taught you. In other words... He wants his followers who have now become leaders to go and make new followers who would eventually become new leaders, who would eventually get new followers who would eventually become new leaders. He wanted his people to go through this growth process of not just becoming great leaders, but also by doing it as great followers. You get the idea. And like I said, starting the first Sabbath after Labor Day, I can't wait to start getting into studies on what it means to be a great leader. But I realize that not everyone is called to be a great leader. Not everybody is called to be a, a, a president or a governor or a politician or a businessman or, or, or the, you know, somebody of responsibility. Somebody that we are supposed to listen to and follow like doctors and scientists and teachers. And some of these hardworking professional people that have been put in res- positions of responsibility. Not everybody is called to that level, but we are all called to follow. We are called to follow humbly, sacrificially, and to follow the vision that is being cast for us on how to make things better than what they are now. We are all supposed to be the same level of followers who are going to follow Jesus that Peter and Andrew and James and John were. Because as end time people, what Jesus is calling us to we find in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 4, the identifying mark of Jesus' followers. It talks about the 144,000, one of those identifying marks, is that these are the people who will follow the Lamb wherever He leads. Today's not an appeal to leadership. Today's an appeal to followership. How many of you are going to say, you know what? My life isn't about me. And I'm ready to follow what God wants me to do. Does anybody here want to be a follower today? Follow God and his plan and to be willing to do so sacrificially and humbly because it's not about me, it's about him? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for just a, a quick reminder of the fact that you called your disciples and not just the 12 who walked the dusty roads with you, but the countless of those ages ever since to follow you. Lord, we're sorry for the times that we've gotten it wrong. We're sorry for the times that we refused to listen when we we got our, our vision cast on the wrong thing or the wrong idea, when we got distracted or selfish or stubborn and stiff necked. We're sorry for the times when we weren't great followers. Lord, help us to do what you will for us to do. Give us the strength when we are weak. Give us the vision when we are blind. And help us to know that it is your will being done and not ours. Lord, I pray that you would be with us and we would go where you would have us to go today and every day because we are here to follow you. You are King of Kings. Lord of lords, and we are your children. So lead us, Father. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. May God bless you as you go forward. Have a good day.